The Second World War officially ended on the 2nd of September 1945, six years and one day following the German invasion of Poland on the 1st of September 1939. With victory in Europe having been declared on the 8th of May 1945, victory over Japan became the focus of the Allied powers. On the 16th of July 1945, the Trinity Test in the New Mexico desert saw the first successful detonation of an atomic bomb. Nine days later, orders for the use of atomic bombs against four Japanese cities were issued, which resulted in the bombing of Hiroshima on the 6th of August 1945, and then Nagasaki on the 9th of August. Figures of those killed in the two bombings range between 129,000 and 226,000. Of these, around 160 are believed to have experienced both bombings and to have survived. Of these 160, however, Tsumu Yamaguchi is the only person to have ever been officially recognised by the government of Japan of having survived both atomic bombs. Yamaguchi was born on the 16th of March 1916 in Nagasaki. During the 1930s he joined Mitsubishi Heavy Industries which was located in the city and worked as a draftsman designing oil tankers. Following the commencement of hostilities, Yamaguchi continued his work with Mitsubishi. As Japanese hopes for a swift decisive war faded, and the United States gained the initiative following defeating the Japanese at the Battle of Midway in early June 1942, Japanese industry began to suffer as resources became scarce and merchant vessels and tankers were sunk. So despondent was Yamaguchi over the state of Japan as the war progressed through 1943 and 1944 that he gave consideration to killing his family with an overdose of sleeping pills in the event that Japan lost the war. During the late spring of 1945, Yamaguchi was sent to Hiroshima on a three-month-long business trip working on the design of a new tanker. During this time, he eagerly awaited his return home to his wife Hisako and son Katsuoshi. On the 6th of August 1945, Yamaguchi was scheduled to leave Hiroshima with two of his colleagues, Akira Iwanaga and Kuniyoshi Sato. The three men were on their way to the railway station when Yamaguchi realised that he had forgotten his hanko, an identification stamp which permitted him to travel. Realising that he had left it at the Mitsubishi yard, he set off walking towards the yard to retrieve it. As he was walking to the Mitsubishi yard, Yamaguchi heard the sound of an aircraft overhead. Looking skyward, he saw an American B-24 Superfortress, the Enola Gay, above. As he watched, a small object was released from the bomber connected to two parachutes. The object was the atomic bomb Little Boy. 44 seconds after being released, at 08.15, bomb detonated, the sky erupting in a blaze of light. Despite being approximately two miles from ground zero where the bomb detonated, the resulting shock wave swept Yamaguchi into the air and spun him as if in a tornado before sending him hurtling into a nearby potato patch. The explosion ruptured his eardrums and caused temporary blindness. In addition to these injuries, Yamaguchi was left with severe burns on the left side of his face and on top of his body. After recovering his senses, he crawled to a shelter where he rested and began to compose himself. After a period, Yamaguchi set out to try and find Iwanaga and Sato, who had also survived the blast. Bridges in the city had been destroyed, leaving Yamaguchi to swim across a river filled with bodies as he searched for his colleagues. Finally reuniting with Iwanaga and Sato, the three men proceeded to the train station which somehow was still operational. With no trains to Nagasaki for the remainder of the day, the three men spent the night in an air raid shelter before boarding a train on the 7th of August. By the time Yamaguchi made it back to Nagasaki, the world knew about the bombing of Hiroshima as President Harry Truman announced that the United States and the Allies had spent $2 billion on the greatest scientific gamble in history and won. Before going on to warn Japan and her leaders, if they do not now accept our terms of unconditional surrender, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air, the likes of which have never been seen on this earth. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many fold, and the end is not yet. With this bomb, we have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction 
to supplement the growing power of our armed forces. In their present form, these bombs are now in production, and even more powerful forms are in development. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. We are now prepared to destroy more rapidly and completely every productive enterprise the Japanese have in any city. We shall destroy their docks, their factories, and their communications. Let there be no mistake, we shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. It was to spare the Japanese people from utter destruction that the ultimatum of July the 26th was issued at Potsdam. Their leaders promptly rejected that ultimatum. If they do not now accept our terms, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. Behind this air attack will follow sea and land forces in such numbers and power as they have not yet seen, and with the fighting skill of which they are already well aware. We have spent more than two billion dollars on the greatest scientific gamble in history, and we have won. But the greatest marvel is not the size of the enterprise, its secrecy, or its cost, but the achievement of scientific brains in making it work. And hardly less marvelous has been the capacity of industry to design and of labor to operate the machines and methods to do things never done before. Both science and industry work together under the direction of the United States Army, which achieved a unique success in an amazingly short time. It is doubtful if such another combination could be got together in the world. What has been done is the greatest achievement of organized science in history. Yamaguchi arrived back in Nagasaki during the early morning of the 8th of August and limped to the local hospital where he received treatment for his wounds. The doctor who treated him was a former classmate but did not recognize him at first owing to the severity of the blackened burns on his hands and face. Swathed in bandages, he returned home where his family did not immediately recognize him, his mother accusing him of being a ghost. The following day, despite his wounds and the trauma endured, on the verge of collapse, Yamaguchi rose and set off to work at Mitsubishi's Nagasaki office. Around 11am, he found himself in a meeting with his supervisor and a company director, who demanded a full report on Hiroshima. Yamaguchi recounted events as best he could, including the blinding light, deafening boom and the shockwave but was accused of being mad, the director questioning how a single bomb could destroy an entire city. As he was trying to explain himself, the landscape outside suddenly exploded in a blinding white flash. At 10.50am, the B-29 boxcar had arrived over Nagasaki. The original target of the bomber, Kokura, had been obscured by clouds and smoke from the nearby city of Yahata which had been firebombed the previous day. Hampered by cloud cover, Boxcar made a couple of runs over the city, looking for a gap in the clouds. Running short of fuel and with no visual target being presented, the crew of the bomber was forced to use radar to drop the bomb. At the last minute, a gap in the clouds appeared, allowing visual contact with a racetrack to be made. The bomb, codenamed Fat Man, was dropped in the city's Urakami Valley, midway between the Mitsubishi Steel and Arms Works in the south and the Mitsubishi Urakami Ordnance Works in the north. 53 seconds after being released, Fat Man detonated at 11.02am. Within the office building, Yamaguchi, who was once more approximately two miles from ground zero, dropped to the ground seconds before the shockwave shattered the office windows and sent shards of broken glass and debris flying through the rooms. Of this moment, Yamaguchi would later say, I thought the mushroom cloud had followed me from Hiroshima. 
The hills that surrounded Nagasaki, combined with a reinforced staircase, served to muffle the blast inside the office. Nevertheless, Yamaguchi's bandages were blown off. Compared to Hiroshima, Yamaguchi emerged relatively unhurt from the bombing of Nagasaki. For the second time in three days, he had had the misfortune of being within two miles of a nuclear explosion. For the second time in three days, he had experienced a nuclear explosion and had been fortunate enough to survive. Fleeing from the skeleton of the Mitsubishi building, Yamaguchi hurriedly made his way through the bomb-ravaged city to check on his wife and son. He feared the worst when he reached his home, which stood partially demolished, but soon found that both were safe and had sustained only superficial injuries. At the time, his wife had been out looking for burn ointment for her husband when the bomb detonated. She and the baby had taken refuge in a tunnel. It was a strange twist of fate, for if Yamaguchi had not been burnt by the detonation of Little Boy at Hiroshima, the detonation of Fat Man over Nagasaki may have killed his family. In the days that followed, the double exposure to radiation that Yamaguchi had endured began to take its toll. His, f his hair fell out and he began to vomit increasingly and the wounds on his arms turned gangrenous. Following the loss of their home, the Yamaguchi family stayed in the bomb shelter. He was still languishing in the bomb shelter when on the 15th of August, Emperor Hirohito announced Japan's surrender in a radio broadcast. Of this, Yamaguchi later recalled, I had no feeling about it. I was neither sorry nor glad. I was seriously ill with a fever, eating almost nothing, hardly even drinking. I thought that I was about to cross to the other side. Japan formally surrendered on the 2nd of September 1945. Yamaguchi, however, would live with the effects of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki for the remainder of his life. At both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, many victims who survived the initial bombing later died of burns, radiation sickness, thyroid cancer and leukaemia. Survivors also suffered from cataracts. Men exhibited a catastrophically low sperm count, while women miscarried. In all, there was a 27% rate of premature births, compared to the normal rate of 6%. Unlike so many victims of radiation exposure, Yamaguchi slowly recovered and went on to live a normal life. He would, however, continue to wear bandages for his skin wounds. Following the war, Yamaguchi served as a translator for the American Occupation Forces and later taught at a school before returning to his engineering career at Mitsubishi. During the 1950s, he and his wife welcomed two more children to their family, both of whom were daughters. In 1957, the Japanese government officially recognised the survivors of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki as hibakusha, or person affected by a bomb. Yamaguchi's identification stated only that he had been present at Nagasaki. He was content with this, satisfied that he was relatively healthy, and tried his best to put the experience behind him by writing poetry and avoiding discussing his experiences publicly. As he grew older, his opinions about the use of nuclear weapons changed. Having already lost the hearing in his left ear as a result of the bombing of Hiroshima, he began to suffer from radiation-related ailments, including cataracts and acute leukaemia. Becoming a vocal proponent of nuclear disarmament, he began to talk publicly about his experiences in the 2000s and wrote a book about his experiences. The 2000s also brought him heartache. In 2005, his son Katsuoshi had died of cancer at the age of 59. The cancer that he had suffered was blamed on radiation poisoning by his family. Three years later, in 2008, his wife, Misato, died at the age of 88, having suffered radiation poisoning from black rain. All three of Yamaguchi's children suffered from health problems which he blamed on their parents' exposure to radiation. In 2006, Yamaguchi delivered a recorded address to the United Nations, in which he pleaded for the audience to fight for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Having experienced atomic bombings twice and survived, he told the UN, it is my destiny to talk about it. Having considered his survival of the two blasts as destiny, in 2009 Yamaguchi applied for recognition as a double bombing survivor. The application was accepted by the Japanese government in March 2009. Yamaguchi was not the only person to endure the blasts of both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. His co-workers Sato and Oanaga also experienced both blasts. 
So too did Shigeyoshi Miramoto, a kite maker who somehow survived the bombing of Hiroshima despite being a mere half a mile from Ground Zero. Altogether, it is believed that 165 individuals may have experienced both the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Despite this, Yamaguchi was the only individual to be officially recognised by the Japanese government as a Niu Hibikusha, or twice-bombed person. The same year that he was officially recognised as having survived the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Yamaguchi was diagnosed with stomach cancer. Living out his days in Nagasaki, he died on the 4th of January 2010 at the age of 93. Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe for more updates, like and share. You can also help to support the channel at Patreon. Details are in the description box below.